When you talk to workers, even the workers that were adamant about voting against the union, they would talk about the fact that the 12 hour shifts were destroying their bodies. Last time we talked to Luis, um, we talked to him about the uh, about the Bessemer campaign. And I remember at that time he was like, well, uh, I asked him about the Amazon labor union. And this was before the first vote. It was right before the first vote was going to happen. And I asked him about it. And he was like, well, I haven't really I haven't really done a whole lot of reporting on that. I don't really know much about it. I, I can't really speak speak to it. Um, and 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 now he, he has he has written. I mean, I think the definitive, you know, the definitive reporting on the Amazon labor union has come from Luis, I think. Well, Luis, just let us know when you are back online. Yeah, oh, yeah, here we yeah, go. Thank awesome. you so much. I, I was listening to the YouTube channel, so, so there was a lag there. So thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for those kind words. <laughs> yes, last time I spoke to you folks, I, I didn't want to comment because I had not done the work of talking to the workers. And, you know, at Labor Notes, we try to... You know, we try to do what's unheard of, which is go directly to the workers and, and talk to them. So um, so without having done that, I didn't feel I was in a place to to speak about the Amazon labor union. But I feel right. that has changed now. <laughs> definitely. I mean, yeah, definitely. Seriously, folks, if you haven't if you haven't read much or if you haven't read Luis's work about it, you've, you've got to, I mean, read his work in, in labor notes and the American prospect in, um, in the real news. I think he's got, he's got articles about the Amazon labor union and all those places. They're all very fantastic. And so since we last spoke, they've had the, the first election, which was a, a huge win. And then the second election, which was, which was kind of a big loss as far as the numbers are, it was a smaller cent, It was a smaller sortation center, but you know, it was like two to one against the union. So let's start, let's start with the first election. How did, wh what were some of the things that came out um, from your reporting on the first election at the fulfillment center in Staten Island that won the union election, um, what were some of the things that stood out to you as you were talking to workers in that in that center? Yeah, um, so I, I just recently wrote the cover story for Indies Times about the win at the Amazon, um, that the Amazon labor union had at the JFK eight uh, fulfillment center on Staten Island. And one of the things I highlighted in that article was the fact that yes, <laughs> I've got it right here. <laughs> beautiful cover, right? It is a beautiful yeah, cover. It is. I don't know if, yes. if folks can see that, but yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's a good one. Um, so one of the things that I try to highlight in that, um, in that profile is the fact that there were three groupings that were critical to the success at JFK 8. One of those groupings was veteran workers, people like Derek Palmer, people like Chris Smalls, who had been at Amazon for more than five years. Um, and that made them, in, in terms of how Amazon workers describe themselves, veterans. Um, you also had mm -hmm. folks that went into the warehouse with a political commitment to organize. Um, that doesn't necessarily make them salts because usually salts are paid by a union to go in with the intention of, you know, organizing. These are people that were roving socialists, if you will, that were seeking a cause to support. And once Chris, Derek, Gerald, Bryson and Jordan Flowers walked out in March of 2020, they went around the country protesting at Jeff Bezos's mansions. And through that process of uh, these protests, they attracted uh, fellow travelers, if you will. Um, and these folks came to JFK 8 and took up jobs there. Um, another group uh, is obviously the folks that, you know, led this walkout. So people like Gerald Bryson, Jordan Flowers, uh, Derek Palmer, and Chris Smalls, they were the four, the original four leaders of the Congress of Essential Workers, and they had moral authority um, to talk about the abuses of power at Amazon. You know, they went out and protested to keep their co-workers safe. And that's something that resonated 
with their coworkers. That facility had been open since 2018. So that meant that they had built relationships with some of those veteran workers. We all know that the turnover at Amazon is about 150%. Um, so to me, it was striking to learn that in addition to Chris and Derek, there were all these other workers like Michelle Valentin Nieves, who had been there for about three years. And they were a familiar face on the shop floor that workers could turn to um, when you know, they had any grievances against management. So I think that was key to their success was that they had a deep bench of natural leaders that um, could connect with and with workers at the at the warehouse, right? People that that they could identify with. What do you think? Um, how how did they go about? How did they go? What what was their what was their strategy uh, that you feel like made them able to win, where nobody? You know, you, you've you've got those four groups of workers, um, and and obviously that. Wh- what was it about those groups of workers that made them successful? Where where everybody else has failed? You know, Amazon has has been around for twenty or thirty years, and nobody has been able. You know, million dollar campaigns have lost huge. Petitions have been filed and withdrawn. Um, and these people, you know, nobody's with nothing, right? I mean, and they were able to to win an election by by a real substantial margin. What separate? What was it? Just that? Do you, something that they that they said a lot was that their independence um, helped them. Is do, do you, does that track with with your conversations with other workers at the facility that their independence helped them? Um, yes and no. I mean, there were workers that I spoke to that said, we're waiting for the Teamsters. <laughs> you know? So for some workers, the fact that they were a scrappy independent union was, uh, uh, was a deficit, right? It was not a, uh, something that, that, that was appealing to some workers. Um, so they had, to, they had to persuade enough workers that they were a credible union, right? So I think where they were effective, here's where we get to the yes part to your question, was that a lot of times one of the things that union busters do is they try to third party the union, say that it's this outside entity that you know is trying to organize workers. In this case, that argument fell flat because the workers themselves were the ones building this union. Um, and the things that they did, the culture of organizing that they built with cookouts, with you know sharing, uh, breaking bread together in the common areas, that was all something that was driven by the workers and by their own understanding of how Amazon mistreated and alienates workers. So they try to counter that alienation by creating bonds of solidarity. So I think that one of the things that contributed to their success was definitely the fact that they were an independent union, the fact that they were not handicapped by uh, the risk aversion, the fear that cripples uh, the official labor movement, those, those, um, those handicaps were not there for them. And they were able to maximize on their scrappiness and creativity because there was no playbook that they were really following. I mean, they did read Jane McAlevey. They read William C. Foster, a communist organizer from the 1930s. Um, but that was among some of the more self-identified leftists. But it's important to not take away from the Black leadership of this movement. Um, and the folks that, that started this were Chris, Derek, Gerald Bryson, uh, Jordan Flowers. There was, they were the ones that set this in motion. And they were not reading uh, William C. Foster. You know, they, just, they were just organic mm. uh, leaders. Um, so... I, I think I go back and forth in terms of like, what was their secret sauce, right? And I think what I've settled on is that there was a lot of what we talk about at Labor Notes around rank and file organizing. Like this was something that was genuinely driven by workers that was bottom up. And I think that that really had an appeal for workers. Another thing that I've said in describing this victory is that it was characterized by momentum organizing. 
So a lot of the organizing that we have seen, especially at places like the News Guild that has been very successful, um, has been an organizing powerhouse in New York City and across the country, um, is structure-based organizing where people map out, you know, the leaders, they, they make sure that um, they have solid majorities before filing for an election. So we didn't see any of that here. We saw a very fearless campaign where workers put everything on the line and they won. Some of the some of the things that you mentioned, yeah, as far as the risk averseness of the official labor movement, uh, would be captured by the fact that nobody files for an election without at least fifty percent, uh, and that's even incredibly rare. Usually, it's they never file without sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety percent of cards. Right. Uh, whereas the Amazon labor union filed with thirty percent. Uh, which is, looking back on it, it, it makes a lot of sense because the turnover is so high. But that's something that, that just other unions would have refused to do, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a piece for uh, a publication based out of New York called um, uh, New York Focus, where I kind of looked at how um, a lot of experts within the labor movement kind of discounted their their chances of winning and, and one of the things that was commonly referenced was the fact that they they filed with thirty mm-hmm. percent or yep. like ba- the bare minimum, right? Um, and right. I got some pushback from a fellow, a friend that's organizer of SEIU. He said, "Well, in healthcare, we filed sometimes with with that." But here's the rub: uh, those units were about thirty people. You know, they were very small, like healthcare units. This was a warehouse of eight thousand plus workers. So it's a different ball game, you know, to file uh, with that. Right. You know, the, the fact that they did cookouts, like I, I used to be in a researcher with 32BJ SEIU, a property services uh, union that represents supporters and um, security guards and airport uh, employees in New York and, and, and New Jersey. And I remember when we were preparing for, for campaigns, like, you know, we had to legalize everything before we took any steps. So imagine mm. doing a cookout by a bus stop. I think a union would be worried that <laughs> that the canopy of the bus right. will catch fire and, you know, they will be liable. <laughs> so, right, so even right. something as simple as that, not to mention, you know, the fact that they were also giving out weed, which is uh, legalized in New York. You know, I, I, I don't think an official union would have looked upon that, you know, favorably as a, as a, right. as a tactic. <laughs> Right. And, you know, that is kind of funny that you got some pushback about saying that filing with 30 percent is not common because everybody I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just I've, I talked to a lot of people in the run up to this and there were there was actually concern about like these people are going to screw it up for the rest of us. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was there was some real, uh, you know. I don't want to say antagonism, but but there was there was real genuine like worry that that not only are they going to lose, but but it's going to be bad for for you know the the big dogs for the, for the real unions to come in there after and try to clean up their mess. Yeah, I mean we heard the same thing about Bessemer, right? Where people people said you you only go into an organizing campaign when you know that you've done your homework you you've covered your mm-hmm. your basis because what what it results when you don't do that is demoralization right we saw the opposite happen right. after after the the first loss in Bessemer we saw that it actually um they were one of the inspirations for the Staten Island campaign right right well i mean folks were f- folks were looking at what happened they went down to Bessemer they saw how things were going and they said, we're going to do it differently. So for them, they kind of drew a negative lesson from that and said, like, this is why you have to do it re- le- worker led. Um, so. So, yeah, I mean, it definitely did play a role in terms of their strategy, because one thing that's important to remember about this campaign, it's that it was kind of two years in the making, but it wasn't. It wasn't like in a calculated way. It wasn't as though they said after the walkout, you know, we're going to first do this walkout. Then we're going to generate excitement. And then we're going to petition to form, you know, to petition for an election and form an independent union. 
none of that was in the cards at that point in time. They were trying to draw attention to the unfair firings, to the plight of essential workers at Amazon warehouses and throughout the country. And then through that process of struggling um, against Amazon and other employers and their college treatment of workers, they decided that they were going to form an independent union. So I think it's just remarkable how that happened uh, because it, it just goes back to the importance of union democracy, to the importance of worker-led movements uh, that are not you know, created from the top down um, to generate buzz and excitement. Like this was something that was real. And, and I think because it was real, people were able to get behind it because it wasn't manufactured in any way. It was a genuine rank and file upsurge. One of the things that we talked about last time you were on is there was a change in tactics from the best in the Bessemer mm-hmm. campaign, um, and I think that you know I, I know I know people that have been that were on both campaigns that organized in both campaigns, and and you know I think that there's there's a bit of I think there is a bit of frustration from people, especially on the first campaign, you know, as far as like. You know, they were like, we were doing the best that we could, right? And and you know that there, you know, the 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 contrast between the Staten Island campaign and the first Bessemer campaign, I think, is kind of frustrating to some of those folks, and I totally understand that. You know, they were like, people forget, like we were in the middle of the first wave of the pandemic, right? We didn't have vaccines. People were nervous, like we, you know, we the house calls seemed really scary to people and and you know we were trying to do the best that that we could but you know noted that in in the second campaign there were house calls uh they were taking actions uh they were winning things how do you feel the you know about the 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 strategies employed by the second bessemer campaign and the first staten island campaign how do they stack up Compare and contrast them, kind of, kind of. If I'm not being too rambling. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, I mean, I think it goes down to the fact that they just had a deeper bench, you know, of rank and file leaders. I mean, I've heard um, different mm-hmm. things from the RWDSU folks that they had their their core committee was about 20 people, which is similar to what they had in Staten Island. But here's the thing: the folks in Staten Island were at the warehouse every day all day Mm -hmm. you know they were basically there 12 13 hours a day on their days off after working 12 hour shifts so they were living and breathing organizing every single day and what was propelling them to do that was a firm conviction that they wanted a union and that the conditions at amazon were uh you know were just terrible enough that they were going to put everything on the line i think when you when you have that level of initiative on the workers part, like that's something that can be replicated. I feel with RWDSU, um, they had folks outside, you know, and they were doing things, but they were not necessarily um, at the warehouse, you know, 24 seven. They were not, um, like their visibility was not as high as it was for the folks on Staten Island. Um, Another thing too, is that the facility in Bessemer is, is a newer facility, right? So, I remember when I went down to Alabama for the first election and, you know, given all the all the comms resources that were put into elevating Jennifer Bates and Daryl Richardson as like the leaders of of this of that campaign. I asked workers about that. I asked like, oh, so uh, what do you think about Jennifer? What do you think about Daryl? You know, and they didn't know them. And because the warehouse was so new. And it's so massive that they just didn't have a chance, you know, to um, to build that familiarity. I don't know if that changed or how much that changed this time around. But this is the thing that we always say at Labor Notes. Workers choose their leaders. It's not the other way mm-hmm. around. So when you come in and you're an official union and you three or four workers reach out to you and say, like, hey, we have people are hot under the collar. They're demanding a union. And then those folks become the spokespeople that might work or it might not, because it's hard to assess what their standing is in the warehouse. And that's where it matters the most. So when, by contrast, when I spoke to people about why they supported the union, they talked to me about Chris Smalls. 
They talked to me about Derek Palmer. They talked to me about members of the committee. So they were familiar with the people um, that were pushing for this union and they could reference them by name and say to me at shift change, oh yeah, I spoke to, I spoke to Michelle, I spoke to Karen, I spoke to Maddie. So it was just a level of familiarity that was just not the case uh, in Bessemer. Now, here's the thing. Mm. Part of that was aided by the fact that the workers in New York were taking public transit. So they were lingering mm. after they got out of the warehouse. I think, to be fair, the folks right. in, in, um, in Bessemer had a tougher chance because people were leaving the warehouse. They were getting in their cars and driving right. um, home. So there was not that much of an opportunity for them to, you know, to spend time with folks. They could have done it during the break areas. They could have done food. But the thing is that it also has to be true to the context, right? Like what is true mm. of the of the context in, in Alabama that's different from New York? So in New York, it did resonate with workers that um, the union was feeding them, that the union was visible at the bus stop. In Bessemer, it would have been... It would have been interesting to, you know, to figure that out. The only people that know the answer to that would be the workers that are in the in the warehouse. So I think those are two things. Um, another thing about the house visits, right? Uh, the Amazon labor union tried house visits, and then workers said workers got very angry about it. They said, if somebody shows up mm. at my house, I'm going to fuck them up. <laughs> you know, so, so <laughs> this is New York. In New York, it's not, you know, you don't want people bothering you coming to your that Southern hospitality doesn't exist out here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, they didn't get invited in for sweet tea and biscuits. Exactly. No, they didn't. And which I did multiple times when I went when I went house visiting with RWDSU. I went in and we. I I don't think nobody people offered me tea and stuff, but it wasn't. Uh, you know, we didn't get any biscuits. But but yeah, it was definitely. I did get invited in, and I sat and talked to people for right for, a while, for quite a while. Right, right. But this is the thing, right? Like they were really attuned to the realities of the workforce in Staten Island, right? Not. Not some abstract, you know, lesson or theory. So, so when the playbook says you must do house visits, you know, they tried that, but then they tore up. They shifted very quickly once it became clear to them that, in addition to a lack of southern hospitality, workers were also embarrassed about their living conditions and they didn't want to invite people mm. in. You know, a lot of the workers that I spoke to were working two jobs in order to make ends meet. So, so they didn't want to invite people into their homes um, and kind of feel ashamed of how they were living. So that, that also factored in. So because there was a small group of workers, that information was captured and they acted on it fairly quickly, right? In a traditional union campaign, you know, you have to go through the ropes uh, in order to implement like a shift in strategy. It doesn't happen uh, by the flip of a, of a, of a coin toss. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that, that aided the, um, the independent union in Staten Island, they were just more nibble in terms of responding to things. So if, if they saw, Hey, a worker approached us from the African community at a captive audience meeting, they figured out how do we get that person involved? And then Brima Sila became one of the leaders. This was two months into the organizing. He set up a WhatsApp chat group with a lot of African workers. He was multilingual. So he had a lot of respect and standing within the Staten Island community and specifically among immigrant um, African workers. So they were just able to bring people in fairly quickly. And that's not always the case, you know, in a big, in a big campaign um, where, you have a chain of command that you have to escalate things, mm. you know, through. Um, so I think that, I, I think that's, those were decisive, you know, factors, but I think ultimately the fact that the warehouse had been around for a much longer time, I think was very key. Right. And those veteran workers. So what, right. So what was the difference then between, do you think that that was the, that was the key that maybe there weren't as many veteran workers in the second Staten Island because the second Staten Island election did end with a loss. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you feel, yeah. what do you feel like the differences were between 
those two campaigns, even though they were run by the same union? Yeah, no, I think that's a key point um, that you hit on. Like, absolutely, they didn't have a deep bench at LDJ5, the sortation center. Um, the face of the campaign were um, folks that had gone in with the intention of organizing. Um, and the facility had opened in March of 2020. So it's relatively new. It's made up of it's the same age as Bessemer. Right. It's made up of uh, part timers and you know, a lot of the, the part-timers, they, they didn't really have those deeply felt grievances that you had at JFK 8. When you talk to workers, even the workers that were adamant about voting against the union, they would talk about the fact that the 12-hour shifts were destroying their bodies, that, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't endure um, at Amazon more than three months because the, the setup of the work environment was one that just burned through people. Uh, at LDJ5, folks were doing 15 hours a week. They had a second job. Uh, the main complaint was the fact that they didn't have enough hours. Some people wanted to be full-time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very different environment. And because they didn't have as deep a bench, they had to rely on some of the natural leaders from JFK-8. Um, and again, if you go back to what I said initially, the campaign at JFK-8 was two years in the making. If you know, Even though it wasn't planned that way, that's the reality. They were organizing and agitating people for two years. So they didn't have as much time uh, with, with the LDJ-5 warehouse. And it's a different kind of warehouse. Right. So uh, those deeply felt grievances were just not um, were just not true at LDJ five. And the work was not as grueling. You know, some people said, you know, the job is relatively easy. I I don't all I want is for Amazon to when I become certified to drive a forklift, I just want to be paid more because of that. So mm. uh, so those were the concerns. Um. How has the uh, how has the ALU responded to the 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 loss? I mean, I think what they are doing is trying to build up, like similar to the folks at RWDSU in Bessemer, they're thinking about even though we didn't win, there were we got a sizable number of folks that supported the union. We're going to continue to act like a union within the warehouse and continue to build on that. Uh, which is the same thing I've heard from the RWDSU folks in, in Bessemer. You know, even though they lost, they or I mean, it hasn't been certified, but it's, it seems that it's trending to a loss. Um, they are going to build on the number of folks that they were able to bring in. Uh, so I think uh, for the folks at, at LDJ5, it will be the same. It will be a, a matter of how do they continue to keep those folks engaged. Right now, they have to begin prepping for contract uh, negotiations, even though Amazon has refused to recognize the union um, and is stalling and is gonna continue to stall. They have to continue to prepare their, their troops to put it everything on the line, including shutting down the facility to get recognition and begin bargaining. So they have a lot of work still ahead of them. How, what about uh, expanding the campaign? Uh, Chris Smalls has, he went on a, it was Fox Business or Bloomberg mm -hmm. Business, and I think he, he was like trolling uh, the, <laughs> the, the host. He said, so, it, it, the host asked like how many other uh, warehouses, and he said something about, we've got contacts at every single Amazon warehouse in the country. And, you know, I don't doubt that, but, uh, you know, if you, if you know, you know, Having one contact at every at, at one warehouse of, of eight thousand people doesn't you know that 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 doesn't a campaign make. But you know wh what are the serious um, plans th that you know of to expand in New York and and, and nationwide? I mean, or, or do you know anything about their priorities as far as like mm -hmm. are are they going to try to fight for a contract harder at JFK eight and then try to expand? Or are they going to try to do vice versa or are they going to try to do both at the same time and you know uh and all of that is going to take 
support from the organized labor movement i i think and and so what how does how is how is organized labor going to play into the campaign moving forward and and i know that was a lot but but i think you can handle it <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the vote of confidence um so <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for the independent union. What I, what I can say is that um, they are going to hold a convening, a national convening after the Labor Notes conference. It was going to happen in June, but they're all coming to Labor Notes. Um, there are going to be opportunities at Labor Notes to meet with other Amazon workers across the country and the world. We're going to have Amazon workers from Poland, from Germany, uh, from other countries come uh, and be part of a, of a meeting with uh, with all the folks that are trying to organize Amazon in the U.S. Um, so that's one thing that I, I hope will be productive and fruitful for, for all the workers that are trying to take on Amazon. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, the strategy of what happens with all those folks that have reached out to them, uh, we at Labor Notes um, facilitated a conversation between uh, different workers uh, across the country, including Cause, which is based out of North Carolina. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're working with the Southern Workers Assembly. Uh, they're, they're a small committee of about, I mean, they've told me they have about 80 people that are trying to file for elections uh, in Gardner, uh, North Carolina, I believe. and. You know, they're, they've heard from folks like that all over the country. Um, I think what would aid them the most is for them to focus on winning a contract at JFK 8, for other workers to support that fight by starting a bunch of fires at other facilities throughout the country to bring some pressure to bear on Amazon and so that they can negotiate, uh, you know, have some leverage in negotiations. I think that it would be it would be very difficult, given their their numbers, for them to divide their forces and dispatch organizers across the country. But definitely holding calls with co work with workers across the country, sharing their lessons, uh, consulting. I think that that would definitely be helpful. Uh, but I don't want to underestimate the challenges of a first contract when you only organize one facility. Amazon right. is adamantly anti-union and they don't want this momentum that the Amazon labor union has on leash to catch on and to spread to other warehouses. So to the extent that the Amazon labor union can spark other rebellions and other warehouses by their example, that would be the right way to go. Right. Absolutely. And Jacob, I'm going I'm to jump in here just yeah, for a sec. Uh, you probably want to ask more about what Amazon is doing uh, to continue their anti-union drive. But something you mentioned earlier that stood out to me was that both ALU and RWDSU here in Alabama, even in uh, you know the face of a, a disappointing election result, they're still sticking around. They're still acting as if they're the union uh, because they, you know, they are, regardless of the uh, election results, they can still operate as a union and organize and represent workers. And sounds like that's what they're doing. And I just wanted to, you know, highlight that because there's a bad reputation throughout the history of organized labor, especially here in the South, where, you know, the, the big unions come in, they try to plant, they lose, they pack up and you never hear from them again. I, you know, I don't know how prevalent that is in more modern organizing, but that's definitely something that has, uh, you know, stuck around, I think, in the imagination of workers who experience that. So uh, I think that's really promising. And I think that is something that gives me some optimism that we're not repeating some of those same mistakes of the past, uh, you know, because I, I think that would just be so deflating were that to occur, uh, to to live up to that stereotype of just coming in, hoping you can win. When you don't, you 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 know dip out of town. I, I think that would just be incredibly demoralizing. So to hear that you know in both situations with different types of unions, different types of facilities, the organizers are sticking around. 
I think that's very positive. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I hope that continues to be the case. I mean, the Mid-South Council is not, you know, on, despite what Amazon says, it's not like a, they're not parachuting. <laughs> they're parachuting right. from yeah. Huntsville, <laughs> you know, and right. ba- uh, Birmingham. Yeah. They're parachuting from Birmingham and Huntsville. To, right. So. They're just hopping in the car going down the road. Right, yeah, right, they're right. They're not coming in from, from headquarters. But, right. yeah, I think that's really promising, and I think mm-hmm. that is going to be essential to combat the really deep, anti-union tactics that Amazon's deploying. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, the, the thing is that after the first election, right, um, the RWDSU did, you know, in terms of national clout, you know, they, they took a big um, step in saying, you know, we're going to take on this behemoth and, you know, people doubted them, but it was definitely the right call, you know, to, to take a swing at Amazon. And what will happen, what will be determinative going forward is once the Teamsters begin, you know, organizing weather and the spotlight kind of shifts from different unions and the work they're doing, that folks can remain committed to the workers that are there and continue to bring in new leaders and new folks uh, to the work. I mean, you think about the organizing that has happened uh, at Smithfield in North Carolina, like that was a mm. decades long fight. So in terms of organizing Amazon, I think it's going to take years. And this momentum right now may potentially be sapped depending on what happens with mm-hmm. inflation and if we enter into a recession. So that's why the time is now. If you are an Amazon worker and you're thinking of organizing a union, do it now. Uh, now is the right. time to act. Strike while the iron is hot. Because we don't know what will happen uh, with a, a new administration, presumably if the Democrats were to lose. You know, the NLRB has played a constructive role. Uh, we have seen, like with Starbucks workers, they just um, they just issued a Giselle order, which is very rare um, in Buffalo mm-hmm. because of how extreme the union busting was. I heard earlier Jacob mentioned that. Starbucks workers in Alabama are also trying to organize. So we just need a wildfire of organizing uh, to continue to build this momentum. Um, the, what we're seeing right now is momentum organizing. The moment of strategic campaigns, as important as those are, um, that, that's in the past. Maybe it will come back. Who knows where things are uh, in a few years. But right now, I would say we are in with Starbucks, with retail workers in Massachusetts. We saw Trader Joe's organize. Uh, We saw Apple store workers organizing. So we just need more and more of that. Yeah, the, um, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I mean, the, the, it, it's definitely the time to 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 organize wherever you are uh, to try to reinvigorate your union um, it, because the the labor market uh, it, it's just everything is is really it, it's just a really good time to organize um, you know there's obviously still going to be a lot of risk because it, it, it's still going to be hard but um, but and, and a point you made earlier was that. The more Amazon facilities across the country are undergoing organizing campaigns and the more workers themselves in these facilities can step up as leaders and and take it upon themselves and not necessarily like wait for Chris Smalls to show up, Mm -hmm. the more they're doing that, the the more that helps that contract fight at JFK 8. And I think that's huge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you got to look at it as kind of a guerrilla warfare thing. And the more the more spots they have to to deal with the more you spread their resources and i know it seems like amazon has unlimited resources and and in a lot of ways i guess it that's that's an accurate feeling but they do still have to plan they do still have to spend money and uh the more their attention can be divided i think that that really does uh play into our hands right how do you feel about the the fact that we're going to have multiple unions going after Amazon, and now we are having multiple unions going after Starbucks. In the past, turf wars were 
They played a very big role in the labor movement. They were the source of a lot of fights. They were the source of a lot of controversy and contention. Um, with Starbucks, we've got now UFCW organizing in Wisconsin, and we've got Teamsters now organizing in New York, I believe it was, uh, Local 130, I think, or maybe 13. And um, and then, of course, you've got the Amazon Labor Union uh, in New York, you've got the RWDSU in Alabama, and then you have the the team, the new Teamsters president Sean O'Brien being quoted in Bloomberg as saying that he wants the Teamsters to be the only union to organize Amazon, which I have to think that the that that's a misquote because that does not track with his behavior with his meeting with chris smalls with his with the teamsters support of the rwdsu i mean i don't understand that comment um but you know i mean how all of the unions have been supportive of alu in public how true do you think that is do you i mean are are we looking at at the beginning of, of really ugly and distracting turf wars for Amazon and Starbucks? Or do you think that that the labor movement will be able to be more cooperative? And, um, yeah, do, do you think we'll be able to be more cooperative yeah. going forward? I mean, I think the song that the current tune that everyone is singing is cooperation. Uh, <laughs> but that can always change, you know, once the stakes are higher. Right. So I feel like right now, uh, the American postal workers have thrown their support behind the Amazon labor union. The Teamsters have as well. Um, in terms of strategic sectors, I mean, I do think it is. I think it, the labor movement does have to be strategic in terms of thinking about like what makes sense in terms of our industry, like for us to organize. Um, so, the 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 idea that you have unions that are hot shopping and have a little bit of, you know, uh, health care, a little bit of education, a little bit of everything, it just reduces their power. And I know that it's been in response to, to the decline of manufacturing in certain, for certain unions, like uh, uh, the radio workers, UE, for instance, you know, a militant union, they just had a big victory by organizing MIT workers, um, and obviously, you know, they, they've lost uh, members to once General Electric started offshoring its jobs. So it's been a very real struggle to, to grow a, as a union that has been concentrated in, in a manufacturing base, right? Like, obviously, manufacturing is not gone. That's, still, that's an overstated claim. Uh, but it's definitely declined right. from its peak. Uh, and unions have suffered as a consequence. So, so I think the way to approach that is to think about how can unions come together as a coalition and say, we're going to take up this big behemoth and how are we going to carve it out so that there's an agreement based on strategy. For the Teamsters, it would make sense for them to prioritize delivery stations within Amazon's network, for them to prioritize those third-party contractors because they're a direct threat to UPS drivers. So, I mean, that is in there. It's an existential threat to the survival of the Teamsters and for, for the workers to retain the standard of living as Teamsters drivers, um, they have to respond to that threat uh, from Amazon. So, so I, I think that's one way to kind of take what O'Brien said and, and say, okay, if the Teamsters were to focus on delivery stations, who focuses on the fulfillment centers? Who focuses on the sortation facilities, right? Because Amazon has a lot of different uh, warehouses. Who takes on the web services division, the most profitable you know, division within Amazon? Those workers have to also be organized. Mm -hmm. So think of the, what the News Guild did by organizing the tech workers at the New York Times. They realized that moving forward, when it comes to contract negotiations, they're going to have greater leverage by having the tech workers in the same union with journalists. So I do think the labor movement and the unions that have some skin in the game when it comes to organizing Amazon, they, they need to put together some kind of consortium and think about how are we going to organize this large company? I mean, that 
UFCW led the way with Walmart, which it still needs to be organized. But there's also Target. Um, there's also, you right. know, like so. So yeah, I mean, I think the turf wars are going to happen. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's to some degree inevitable uh, that unions are going to try uh, to to pursue a shortcut. But I think right now um, there is some real momentum behind a more rank and file um, led uh, efforts to organize. And the unions are kind of following the lead of the workers. So we've seen that very clearly with Starbucks. SEIU Workers United, they have come in and they have been supportive. But when I've talked to the workers, it is someone a Starbucks worker who handles their comms, who handles, so it, it's right. very scrappy. Uh, so, I mean, I get why some unions want a piece of the action and say like, okay, how can we, how can we insert ourselves here? But there's so much, there's so many workplaces that are unorganized. Um, and it, it's not just Starbucks. You see this with the weed dispensaries, you know, where folks are also fighting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to organize those sectors. Um, but I, you know, even for RWDSU, like I, I went down to Gainesville, Georgia, um, after there was a chemical leak. And I'd be curious why the Mid-South Council doesn't go into Gainesville and talk to workers there and see like, hey, we represent poultry workers in Alabama. We have a shared interest um, hmm. in, as, as workers in these poultry plants. Um, this is what we've done with our workers in Alabama. This is what the benefits of a union are. So I do think that unions do have to reassess the hot shopping and being general, general unions and becoming more focused in key sectors because that's where the, their power and leverage will come from. Right. Luis, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Adam, do you have anything else? Uh, no, just that we'll see you at Labor Notes in yeah. a couple of weeks. Really excited about it and really appreciate all your work and, and the work of the entire Labor Notes team for Thank you. putting this amazing conference on. Yeah, we're looking forward to Jacob uh, facilitating Organize the South, our, our panel uh, discussion on, yeah. on the great stuff that's happening uh, down south. So thank you all for, for joining yeah. us. I'm lo yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Dan sent me the list of folks that are going to be on. Looks like it's going to be a good panel. I uh, think we're going to be able to do Dan – Dan is trying to get me set up to where we can do the show live from ah. Labor Notes on Saturday morning. Uh, so maybe we can – we can just pull some folks as they're passing by and pull them in for an interview really quick. Yeah. Uh, but, but it'll yeah, be like the I'm, Super Bowl for us. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Or as Kim calls it, a uh, labor prom. Labor so, prom. Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be great. All right. Well, thanks, Louise. Really Thank looking you. forward to it. See you here in a few weeks. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm.